You're listening to the TV Obsessive channel, presented by tvobsessive.com. Hello, welcome back to the TV Obsessive podcast here today for episode 54. It's the one year anniversary of the podcast today. Uh, as always, um, I'm Cameron Crane, executive editor for tvobsessive.com, joined by Ryan Kirksey, writer and contributor for the site. How are you doing today, Ryan? We're doing great. Happy one year together on this podcast. Uh, we've covered a lot in that time. We are also entering into a very busy period of, of content. A lot of that we'll touch on coming up, but yeah, overall doing great. Well, cool. yeah, I, I believe it was June 13th that we recorded our first podcast. That's so right. June 14th. <laughs> It's pretty, I mean, it's pretty directly spot on, you know. I mean, yeah, uh, first day of the second year, I guess. Here we go. Uh, we started with the bear. People can go if people want to go back. We're going to be back to the bear really like next week, kind of previewing the upcoming season three. And then we'll talk about season three when it comes out in a couple of weeks. The timing matches up pretty well. It comes out on the 27th. We'll record on the 28th and get that out there. Um, but today we're going to talk about three body problem, which is Ryan's choice for his, um, show of the past 12 months that he's chosen to talk about on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, there there are not not many that the entire season dropped in the past the past year and some of the things I watched, you know, just missed the cut off. So uh yeah, I thought this would be an interesting experiment to go through this and and you 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 committed to the to to what we're doing here and you you watched it this week. I did watch it. People who are regular listeners of the podcast will know at the end of the pod last week. Ryan, knowing that I had not gotten around to watching it, suggested maybe I don't. Uh, and I decided, well, no, I, I, have, I have to be prepared. I can't just do that. It might have been interesting. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I also thought about the idea. There, there was another podcast that did this. I forget what it's called now. Apologies. But where they would talk about a show and someone who had never seen it would watch the first episode of the show and then the last episode of the show. <laughs> like over the course of seasons. You know, I thought about doing that. That's not the one season I had. I've got time. I'll, I'll I'll get into it, and you know I enjoyed it. We'll talk about that in the latter part of the pod. Uh, three body problems. So three people have um, also watched that. First, as per usual, talk about what's been in the news this week, and so on and so forth. Um, what caught your eye this week, Ryan? Yeah, a lot of a lot of news coming through um, this week. Maybe uh, one of the things that you and I are looking forward to most are some several shows coming on Apple TV Plus. We got one of these. Know, sizzle reel things that yeah. uh, they they released that sh- showed a few seconds of Silo and Severance and other shows um, upcoming. Slow Horses, new season, but yeah, I think the the Severance and Silo footage were the things that uh, we've really been looking for for some time. Those are the things that stood out to me, and of course, those are also the things where they have such obsessive fan bases that you see people, uh, you know, um, trying to do deep analysis of the five frames of uh, you know severance footage we got or whatever he, like, he has balloons. What does it mean there? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, but also because you know we've been on top of severance in terms of okay, it's in production. Okay, they wrap filming. When are we going to get it? And I think getting it included in this teaser here in June makes me more confident than ever that we're going to get it before the year's over. But yeah, I don't know for sure, but that, that's a great point. 2025, but I was going to ask you that very same question is, is seeing this now, will this now lend itself to one or both of these shows being a you know, holiday late 2024 release looks more and more likely now? It does. I mean, particularly if you look at that teaser as a whole, a number of the things that they're advertising in it have release dates, mm-hmm. maybe in the lake, you know. Was it Bad Monkey with Vince Vaughn and like this movie with Brad Pitt and George Clooney? Yes. You know, it's just called Wolves. Wolves. I think not, it must be like their last name. Or, or not yeah, not Wolves. Wolves. It's not Wolves. It's called Wolves. Yep. Um, and it was actually looks kind of fun, but then Severance and Silo, which there had not been, to my knowledge, any previous announcement about release dates at all. And there still isn't. They're still not putting release dates on those shows in here. Right. But that they're packaging it together with something like Dark Matter, which is out right now, Presumed Innocent, which came out like two days ago, you know, uh, Pachinko, which comes out in August. You know, it kind of feels like a rest of 2024 uh, teaser, but 
We yeah, th this sure. would be it would be some clever, uh, <laughs> clever marketing and maybe a bait and switch that they did not. Then I, I would say in the next month or two, we should be hearing something about a date for this. And I yeah, I'm with you. I think this will mean 2024. Why would they show us something and say, oh, a year from now, you're going to see severance that that would be quite disappointing. Right. Unless they said it, you know, like you'd almost expect them to say it up front, you know, like 2025. But this is just. I don't know. No, we're really good yeah. things. I know that you, as I uh, am, a big fan of Severance. I don't quite recall. Did you watch Silo? Yes. Yes. You oh, yeah. You might have liked it more than I did. I wrote on yeah. Silo. So Silo is actually one of those shows I've now, uh, we'll talk about this later with another show, but uh, two other shows, actually. Um, but one of the shows where I'm going to now plan to go read the source material ahead of Silo. I've heard that these short stories are incredible, so I'm going to try to do that ahead of this this second season. All right. Well, if you want to write on Silo season two when it comes out, I will give it to you. <laughs> oh, not, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wrote on season one. I mean, it was you know I'll watch season two for sure, but it was I don't know. I I just I constantly feel like there are people in the world who were into Silo way more than I was, mm. you know. And so I was always had like kind of little criticisms or like I'm not sure, you know, quite about what this show is doing and so on and so forth. And I can continue to do that. Yeah. But, you know, if you're really into it, particularly if you're going to go read the source material, if you want yeah. to write on it when it comes out, you can. Severance, though, I, I do claim. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, I, other people that, could probably get true. in there on that one, though. There's that, more anyway. That's your baby. I, I'm, I'm not going to take that, that take that one from me. Other people could get in, in in slightly different ways. Anyway, I started talking shop here on the podcast. Well, let's move forward. <laughs> um, Paul Giamatti is going to be in Star Trek Starfleet Academy. Yeah, we just uh, had Holly Hunter. Holly, Holly Hunter news a couple of weeks ago that she's going to be in this show. Now, Paul Giamatti is a as a villain, which is, I mean, great. This is the best possible thing for for him. He, he's he's wonderful in these these villainous roles. Yeah, we don't really choose the scenery a little bit, you know. Yeah. I don't know why, but there's there's some small part of me that almost feels like Star Trek isn't supposed to have such big names. Maybe I'm overestimating the celebrity of Paul Giamatti. I mean, he's done mobile phone commercials after all. That's true. I mean, he does have an Academy Award, but that was yeah. 20 years ago. So, yeah, maybe, maybe you're, I mean, he was Rhino in Amazing Spider-Man 2 or something. I, I mean, he, he'll do pretty much anything you, you want him to. I guess he does do various things. So, I don't know. That's exciting. Maybe let's seg on that, right? Because we're talking about Michelle Yeoh having been in Star Trek Discovery. And of course, all we were refreshing our memories and like all the tons of things that she's been in, including everywhere. Um, I'm sorry, everything, everywhere, all at once, right? Yeah. Um, so she's in the upcoming Blade Runner show that Amazon Prime is making, and they just announced also Hunter Schaefer is going to be in it. It's Blade Runner yes. 2099. Um, we've talked about this briefly before, but I don't know thoughts about the casting, about the show, and so on. Yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about Hunter, Hunter Schaefer. I've not seen Euphoria. I think we've talked about this, um, which is where I, I think she really became or, or really made herself known as part of that show. Um, she's, I think, in the new Hunger Games movie, which I've also not seen. Um, so not too familiar with her work, but she does have a lot of acclaim, particularly from Euphoria. And, and every time I see one of these Euphoria, you know, emerging rising stars that have all this other work, I just think... Oh yeah, well, this is this show's never coming back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there were. It's funny because there were there were there were some things in the news, as it were, this week about Euphoria, also, but there was nothing there. There's no there there, right? You know, uh, I was like, I read the article. I go, I already knew this. Like, it's not going to be set in high school anymore. And yeah, but HBO still wants it. And Sam Levinson's off, yeah, working on writing season three or whatever. And it's like we've heard all that before. Hunter Schaefer, I will say, I think she's quite good in it. It's funny, I forgot that they made that Hunger Games prequel. Um, which I, maybe I want to watch at some point. I've, I've, I've read, have you read the books? you ever read the Hunger Games books? I've read the, the three primary novels, yes. They're very good. And, yes, and like, the films are just almost too straightforward as adaptations in my mind. <laughs> yeah. My example of how going almost page by page is too straightforward. But anyway... Um, yeah, she's been in some other films and such lately, and all like everyone in Euphoria seems to just have a burgeoning acting career. So, can they get the gang back together to do that's the problem? Three, yeah, I, mean, I think you, they like we have two or three 
mega mega stars now that were on euphoria and then you have everyone else that just sort of risen to a level of are you going to be able to ever get these people in the same room at the same time again that's the problem yeah like sydney sweeney and she is one of euphoria kind of seems like a side character <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know um so yeah it's interesting she takes more you know a little bit more center uh position and in, in season two for what's worth i know you haven't seen it i have seen it we talked about that before but yeah blade runner 2029 i'm intrigued by this you know um particularly with the casting it seems like hey maybe this will be good you know i'm curious to kind of re-enter the world of blade runner in live action which hasn't happened since the uh Ryan Gosling movie, right? There's yeah, the I was say, that's series that they made a number of years ago. Yeah, um, yeah, this will be on. Lotus. Yeah, this will be on Prime. Prime Video will have Blade Runner twenty twenty ninety nine, but I did not see a date for this either. Just casting news right now. Yeah, I think it's always when you're getting casting news, then it's probably pretty far out when you're actually going to get the show, right? Yeah. So probably also with Star uh, Starfleet Academy, which you mentioned. I mean, maybe next year, right? But certainly yeah. not. So they're not sure. Um, we got a trailer for the show Sunny, starring Rashida Jones. Joseph yeah, this Nick this, this was this was great. I, I I um had not read or seen much about this show before watching this trailer. I I, I really am a Rashida Jones um fan. She has done a lot of a lot of good things, including a couple of good things for Apple TV. Um. This is, as I understand, based off of a book, uh, Dark Manual, which uh, very popular for crime tech thriller. Uh, but this this trailer is on the list of ones that got me. I- I'll be watching this this show certainly. Yeah, I thought it looked pretty fun. Comes out yeah. next month, July tenth. Um, so I'm definitely thinking about watching it. Potentially, maybe I'll write on it. I don't know. You know, it's um, I'm doing phantasmas right now, which. Again, recommendation to the world. Watch Phantasma. <laughs> Another show that has a cute little robot in it. Sunny has a cute little robot in it. Yeah. Although the robot in Sunny looks like it might be a little bit, I don't know. It might, it might be nefarious. I don't know from the trailer, but we'll see. But yeah, I'll check that out next month. I want um, to ask you, you know, we should have maybe mentioned this when we we're talking about the severance and silo. Um, I think you and I have always had, I mean, a real strong affinity for what Apple TV Plus is producing. Um this streamer, I, I think in the larger sort of culture is rising the ranks, right? Yeah. In terms of people understanding the quality that they are putting on. We've obviously talked about Severance and Silo. We, you and I covered Constellation, which they did cancel, but they've got Presumed Innocent. They've got Dark Matter. They've got, you know, if you want your soap opera thing, they've got Morning Show and Palm Royale and some of these other shows. They did the Master of the Air uh, follow up to the Band of Brothers and the Pacific documentaries. Um, I've told you how much I love Loot, the comedy on there with with Maya Rudolph. They they just have a lot of quality things they're putting out. It seems like they're doing something new every month. Yeah, and even the things that I've watched on Apple TV Plus that I don't particularly care for, like Shrinking, where there's all else could be new Shrinking, and <clears throat> with no offense to Shrinking fans, I don't really care for it. Um, I, I I'm like I don't know. I watched three episodes and quit. So maybe it gets better, but um, <laughs> but that the, what the reason I mentioned that Ryan is that even a show like that, my criticism of it is it feels mediocre, you know, or it's like yeah. just just kind of not my thing. I'm not going to say it's bad; it just doesn't quite land for me. What it's doing, the style of humor in it, uh, and I just kind of more feel like it's not for me. Then I would say it's bad. I would even go so far as to say it's it's pretty good for what it is. If you want yeah. something like that, so you know, I think that Apple TV Plus is kind of doing well at at servicing, um, you know, different genres and ways that do land for people. Because I know a lot of people love shrinking. Yeah, when, yeah. you know, That's to true. mention that as an example, <clears throat> for me, it just felt like I don't know. Some, there's something about it that. Um, I wasn't really into, but I do think that they're doing, they don't have a lot of like direct, which I feel like other yes. streaming yes. service. <clears throat> yeah. So you're looking at, you, you compare it to, you know, say even a, a Netflix or a Hulu or these other streamers that you'll just see stuff come across that they're just, 
I mean, they're just trying to put something out to to appeal to the reality TV crowd or, or just something out as a, a comedy or something they, you know, just just something to satisfy a certain certain base of, of audience. Apple TV seems to have pretty smart segmented things that they do. And I've just been a fan of a lot of what I've seen there. Yeah, I mean, it can feel like Netflix. I've even kind of read this in terms of behind the scenes. That's their strategy. They just throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. You yeah, know, it's like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, sure, we'll produce it. We'll just see. See yeah. how it does, you know. <laughs> Whereas, um, whatever they are explicitly, Apple does seem to have some kind of criteria in terms of curating what's available on Apple TV Plus, which is yeah. interesting. And and I don't know. And I appreciate before, it. And before we leave, Sunny, just want to shout out Japan. Japan's sort of having a moment in the television right now. I think that Tokyo Vice was in the news of something that was just canceled after two canceled. seasons. Obviously Shogun was very popular. Uh we have Sunny coming. Um so, several things that uh um, Sugar. Sugar started Sh- Japan, Sugar that had some a Japanese connection. The Monarch, King of the Monsters took place in in primarily in Japan. So a lot of uh you know we know these are a lot of uh co-production financial things that are causing this to happen. But uh so Japan having its its moment right now in television. Yeah, it was just cool. And yeah. well, let's hit the one. We've got one more Apple TV Plus thing yeah. we're excited about, right? Hijack season two. Yeah, this is fantastic. Again, Idris Elba, who I did read this show was the only other show on Apple TV Plus besides Ted Lasso to sort of hit the top of the streaming charts that's been an Apple uh, Apple production. So, yes, this is a season two after the wildly popular first season which saw Idris Elba on a hijacked plane. Again, you and I have debated in the past, <laughs> is he going to walk onto another hijacked plane? Um, his job, I, I did see in this, is a corporate negotiator. So he could you know, apply his skills in a lot of different places. So we may have some you know, hijacked things on the ground this time. But uh, this, was, this was a good enough show that this um they've added some some interesting folks to this second season but it's definitely coming and i i could not be more excited about it yeah maybe a boat a boat yeah i took a boat <laughs> can uh, i take a 18 yeah they and... added uh i was looking at this and uh again yeah, refresh my memory they added a few people and definitely one of them is um you know that guy from that thing um <laughs> you're talking what, what, toby toby jones, jones. oh yeah t- totally yeah. The uh, the assistant Nazi scientist from the Captain America movies, probably where you've seen him before. Oh, is that oh, where I know him from. He's in all ty- He's in all kinds of stuff. Yeah, he's yeah. one of those character actors where he shows. He's like that guy. Yeah, you know? exactly. So um, that's that's good. That's cool. Yeah, but again, just more Apple stuff, and and Hijack was fantastic. So I'm I'm looking forward to this second season. Awesome. Uh, hitting a down note. What do you think about this? I I, I also had this story, and we put it in our notes first. Um, with late night with Seth Myers, that they're the big news is they're getting rid of the band for budgetary yeah. reasons. Yeah, this was d- disappointing, not just in the micro sense of, oh, okay, you know, for for the show, Fred Armisen was often the leader of that band. You know, they have a good, they have a sort of good rapport between them. Um, it's also more of an indication of where late night TV may be headed. I think there's some. Some of these shows are sort of across the board, cutting costs. Um, yeah. Things like Jimmy Fallon getting these big long-term contracts, Jimmy Kennel getting large contracts. But in terms of just the late-night TV landscape, I think this is more in line with where where things are heading. So they'll you know keep it going because you know late late night is a property, but but they'll they'll trim it down as much as possible. Yeah, and it makes a certain kind of sense, which is not to say I endorse it by any means. It got me thinking about it, though. You know, throughout the history of these late night talk show programs, there's been a band. Yeah, you know, right. like they've always they always have a band. Why do they have a band? You do they need to have a band? Like you can easily see if they're thinking about making budgetary cuts, they could say, well, like the band is kind of to the side yeah. of the meat of the show. We can get rid of the band, you know. Uh, and in fairness, you know, the, the band here, the members of the band, from what I read, they all said, look, man, they treated us well. They treated us well during COVID, uh, during the lockdown and all of that. They treated us well during the strike. Seth Meyers been nothing but kind. You know, he didn't he didn't want to do this. So the showrunner didn't really want to do this. But, you know, it's like, whatever. Um, on the other hand, have you ever been to a taping like this live? I have been 
to Jimmy Fallon twice. Yes. Yeah, we talked about this before. I've also been with Jimmy Fallon. I went to a couple other things, lived in New York City for like 15 years. Um, there, it feels like the band's more important. Did yes, you have that feeling? Absolutely does. They are an essential part of, uh, uh, yeah, raising the, um, the the mood and the attitude of the audience. Um, yeah. Engaging with the audience, providing some different cues for things. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, that was the roots so it's maybe a you know just yeah. sort of this is awesome to see the roots but the uh yeah the band there at least in my experiences and those types of filmings and programming is essential to the sort of the audience interaction piece of it yeah i, I agree you know so that got me thinking okay well in meaningful way the band is there for the live studio audience more than the band is there for the tv viewing audience but of course the live studio audience also doesn't pay Generally speaking, for these things, you just get to go for free. You have, you have to go through bureaucracy. Yeah, but, uh, all of these things are are free if people aren't aware. If you really want to go attend the taping, you go to New York City, you figure out how to do it. And yep. um, the hardest one, uh, the one that I never did, was Saturday Night Live because it's like people camp out overnight. Yeah, I heard that one's next to impossible to, um, to so get. Not, Jimmy, Fallon, Jimmy Fallon was not doing that. Figure out the time and watch watch online. It was relatively easy to get your name in the list you whether you're picked or not but um yeah some of these things i've heard colbert is difficult as well to to get i into. went to colbert early on uh in the uh in his current show i also went to the colbert report when, mm. uh, and i went to the daily show one time uh and all of those were like you had to know when they were going to do it but then um you could um, put in the claim for tickets online for certain days, and then like you might not get them. Yeah, but if you did get them, they were free. But then they overbook them and tell you to show up a couple hours early to get in line. Yeah, and then people at the end of the line don't get in, and they give them a ticket for a later show. They right. want to. I mean, the basic logic is they want to make sure that it's full. You can't have an empty audience, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but that was all really fun. And yeah, <clears throat> anyway, back back to the story we started with. I definitely think it's a huge bummer that they're getting rid of the band. I think it's sad. I don't like it. Yeah. I don't feel like there's anything I can do about it, you know, but... Um, I did note here at the very end of this link that we have to this story about the budget cuts, it does talk about how Meyer recently signed a deal to keep him on that program through 2028. So as those years get longer and price tags get higher, more of these types of things I fear are going to get, get cut over the years. Yeah, I suppose. They so. want, they want to keep the talent, right? They're going to want to keep the talent. So what do you do? You have to start cutting other things. I guess. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this is, I don't like it. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, so Game of Thrones stuff. I think that's all we have left. We we did the yeah, lots of the uh, as you might imagine with the new season of House of the Dragon coming Sunday night. A lot of news coming out. No surprise here. It's been renewed for a third season, even before the second season airs. Um, we know, you know, I think we know, but I think it's safe to assume based on clues from this season, uh, we're going to get I think probably four seasons of House of the Dragons. They can tell that complete story. And then other things that once previously thought to be dead or sort of in limbo have also been revived because of just sort of renewed interest happening right now. A prequel series called 10,000 Ships at a thousand years before Game of Thrones is being revived. Um, we know that um, Night of the Seven Kingdoms, based on a short story that's coming in 2025, is filming now. Um, we won't get the Jon Snow show but it sounds like everything else is back on the table even a couple of animated series i heard one of the actors right. in our current show say oh yeah they've approached me about using my voice for an animated spinoff uh for one of the house of the dragon characters so yeah everything is back on the table in the the land of the dragons again yeah and, and mostly prequel stuff which makes sense yeah the john snow idea was the only sequel yeah. idea and as we discussed on a previous pod when they said it's you know been shelved um it very much seems that they never actually had an idea right other than maybe john snow show question mark yeah, yeah. um 
I have ideas for our John Snow. Right? <laughs> it's just like, yeah, I can go back up in the north and oh no, there's White Walkers again. You know what I mean? And like, you know, whatever. I think they are uh, very cautiously trying to stick to text now after what happened in Game of Thrones. There are short story Duncan Egg short stories that have Night of the Seven Kingdoms. There are stories that exist in terms of this 10,000 ships uh, show that they're trying to put together. Uh, so I think they're very weary of going outside of George R. R. Martin's source text after what happened in season seven of eight of the show. Yeah, I still just don't think that's, I don't know that that's the entire reason yeah. that it was, but you know, um, fair enough. But okay. yeah, so House of the Dragons coming up, season two is coming up on Sunday night. Uh, you're going to be writing on it for the site. We published an article that you wrote this week, uh, kind of previewing season two, recapping season one, however you want to put that uh, exactly. So clearly you're excited. Anything else you want to say? The last yeah, very, very, very excited. I've um, rewatched season one ahead of this new season. I have read the book. I know Cameron, what dragon belongs, to what writer, what kids belong to what parents, even though they're all named the same thing. So I'm, I'm ready to go here. I've awesome. got history and the lore. So bring yeah. it on. I'm ready to, ready to take it. I was, I was impressed in the article you wrote on uh, that we published uh, yesterday that you did not misspell any names. <laughs> yeah. I, I will, I will play the bit on whether I have entered all those yeah. names into my uh, spell Good job. Ahead having to write about them for the next eight weeks. Good job. Uh, we have articles on, uh, uh, Timothy Glareton did recaps on season one. If people want to go and read those, uh, also, um, no offense to Tim, I'm not trying to call him out, but I, you know, I had to make I always did make a habit of check, double checking the spelling of names because <laughs> I mean, they're just does the A come before the E or does the E come before the A? Anytime you think there should be an E, there's actually a Y, every <laughs> name it. is one yeah. Letter different, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like this guy's name is Simon, it's a Y, you know, <laughs> that's so. right. <laughs> Um, anyway. Yeah, very very excited about that. That's going to be my life for eight weeks. So ready to get going. Good times. Yeah. Um, want to briefly mention Doctor Who. I was talking last week about how I caught up on the recent season, and then this past week's episode, I was on the fence about you know, oh, do we take the time to talk about it? But I actually saw like a deadline was treating this as a news article when I was looking through things uh, yesterday. Uh, so anyway, this past week's episode of Doctor Who called Rogue featured. Uh, Jonathan Groff, um, getting gay with the doctor, man. Oh, okay. Happy Pride. And so that was that became a a a news story here in in June of 2024. Deadline's news story was that it was the first time in Doctor Who that you had uh, two men kissing actually in the show or something like that. I see. You know, okay. which is like okay. I mean, like I guess. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, but it was a fun episode. It was also kind of like uh, an homage to Bridgerton, which came out. I haven't watched Bridgerton. I know. I apparently a lot of people love Bridgerton. Uh, Isabel Green wrote a couple things uh, for the site on it with uh, stuff coming out this week. You ever watch Bridgerton? I've never seen one second of Bridgerton. Unfortunately, I don't think it's for us. No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, other than that, um, started watching Resident Alien. Have you ever watched the show? With, no, uh, I've never seen. I've played the. Survey? This is a game, right? I've played the game a few times, I believe, but I don't think I've ever watched the show. This, I don't know. I don't think it's a game. Is it not a game that exists? I thought there was an old place or PlayStation or Xbox game that was Resident Alien. I guess not. I don't know. You you think it was Resident else. Evil. Oh, okay, that's what it is. I played Resident Evil. Okay, yeah, Resident Evil is a horror game. Uh, I do think Resident Alien is based on it. A graphic novel or something like that. I don't, ah, okay. those, I don't have those details in front of me, unfortunately, <laughs> with apologies to the graphic novel fans. Uh, but the show is pretty cool. I mean, it's uh, basically our protagonist, played by uh, Alan Tudyk. Are you familiar with him from things? He was uh, Yes, uh, I do know Alan Tudyk well. Fun fact, my mother-in-law was his math teacher in high school. Oh, really? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. He's, he's hit the big time. Because right? I feel right. like this is the first time he's ever had the role as the main character in a yes. thing. You know, he's always, previously, he's always felt like the guy who plays the, you know, um, geeky scientist uh, side character or something yeah. like that. Um, but, a very accomplished voice actor, too. Yeah. So here he plays a uh, alien who's come to Earth and he's in, he's disguised himself as a human being. And it turns out the guy whose body he's mimicking was a doctor and he gets roped into being the town doctor. 
but really, and this might feel like a spoiler, but it's it's not it's not because it's like in the premise and like the first episode. Yeah, um, he's supposed to be here to kill all of uh, humanity, um, but he's lost his device to do it, and then he's like, I don't know. It it, it becomes this interplay of he starts making human connections, and there's that question of whether he's going to carry out his mission of um, killing all human beings. And, uh, oh okay okay so okay. it's kind of fun I mean, yeah that's, that, that sounds fun there's, there's not also on, like the resident evil which i'm familiar with so <laughs> resident alien is a completely different concept yeah totally different right resident evil is like a horror <laughs> yeah zombie thing right um and this is more of a besides the alien aspect of it it's more yes. of a northern exposure kind of vibe because he's in this like Okay. Small town in Colorado, you know, with I don't I even know how, what the population is, so five thousand or something like that, you know. Um, so it's a good show. I recommend it. I watch it on Peacock. Okay, but it's also available on Netflix. Um, oh, interesting. I didn't know they were sharing things these days. I don't know if the most recent season is available on Netflix. I didn't okay. check. Season three just came out. It just ended in like March or April or something like that. Um. Either way, watching Peacock with with ads, yeah, uh, and then I went over to Netflix, watched Three Body Problem, which we're about to talk about. And uh, I don't know, do you have Netflix with ads or do you have it without ads? I have it without. Yeah, um, I used to have it without, and I was kind of I was signing up for it again. I booked my cards on the table there, and so I don't know, I've been watching Peacock with ads. Maybe I'll you know maybe I can deal with ads. Maybe I actually yeah. can. I mute them. Um, and uh, then it's it proceeded to like show me no ads for the first six episodes of Three Body Run. <laughs> and I'm like, what are there going to be ads? Okay, but then there were then there were some, then there were some. But, Interesting. Uh, I thought, oh, Ezra, okay. Before we get off of streamers into what we're going to talk about, I heard this or read this this week in my my prep. This this is maybe interesting to no one but me. Um, but to anyone who is going to watch House of the Dragon. So I have heard that if you have the the standard no ads, fifteen dollars a month subscription to Max, then you're going to get HD only or HD as a as sort of a maximum viewing format. You no longer can get 4K if your TV or your you know whatever you have that you, you're going to watch this show on, which is designed for 4K. If you have just the fifteen ninety nine no ads, you're only getting HD. You have to pay five more dollars to Max to get the four K streaming option. If you want the absolute optimum House of the Dragon viewing experience, um, give our you know Warner Brothers Discovery overlords five more dollars a month. Is that all you get for those five dollars? You have me curious. How many people out there are willing to pay <laughs> five more dollars a month? Yeah, I mean, for, for video if you, quality, if you've paid all that money for your 4K TV and you realize, well, I've been looking forward to this show all year, but I'm only going to get, you know, 1080p streaming quality out of it. Maybe that would. I, I don't know. But uh, apparently that's what you get for your your additional five dollars. Hmm. Well, good note. Good so note. if you yeah, care about the 4K, yes. you got a couple of days, you can up your plan. There you go. Uh, for, for yeah, I'm happy to take your money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so I think let's talk about three body problem. Um, spoilers are going to be on the table here for all of season one. That's all that exists in the world at this point. We have noted on the bottom that's been announced that there's going to be at least a couple more seasons, but two um, more seasons. Yep. Season one, all is is all that's out right now. So all of spoilers will be on the table for season one of Three Body Problem upon Netflix on the other side of our brief musical interlude. And um, yeah, see you in about 10 seconds. Okay, we are here to talk about Three Body Problem, the complete first season that aired on Netflix. It dropped all at once on March 21st, 2024. This is from a series of novels adapted, written, created by David Benioff, D.B. Weiss, and Alexander Wu. In the 1960s, during the Chinese Cultural Revolution, Ye Wanji, a Chinese astrophysicist, 
is jailed for her scientific beliefs, but eventually transferred to a secret military base that's trying to make contact with extraterrestrials. After a series of horrible incidents, she decides to communicate with those aliens and give them the information they need to migrate to or take over Earth. In the present day, the aliens' technology begins to interfere with our world. They eventually make themselves known to the people of Earth and that they will be arriving in 400 years. Present-day scientists and government officials begin trying to make plans for what seems like hopeless and inevitable future, but the one that is many centuries away. So that is... A very conservative short summary of a lot yeah, very, of com complex things that happen. Um, very brief recap. You didn't even mention the video game. Yeah, this is, yeah, the three-body problem. The idea of that title is from a game called The Three-Body Problem, which some of our present-day scientists find themselves in and having to solve different problems. Uh, helps them uncover what actual the intentions of of the aliens are. Um Maybe just started with this, that, yeah, this is the first season of what's, what sounds like will be three. It's also adapted primarily from the first novel of three in this series. It touches a little bit on the beginning of the second novel. Um, this is a show that has a lot of, shall we say, sort of scientific discussion, ideas, theories, um, gets deep into the weeds there, but not nearly as deep as it does in the books. They kind of had to make it very audience friendly um how did you find all of that did you get weighted down on you at all did you find that sort of took away from the the story what did you think about this with how much depth there was to that i mean i don't know in terms of <clears throat> i haven't read the book which you have i believe mm -hmm. right yes. um i wonder various aspects of the show did make me think about whether i would enjoy the book more actually being the the kind of person that I am, the fan of science fiction and inquisitive mind and, and all yeah. of that. Like in, in terms of the science that's in the show, I actually don't really feel like there is science in the show. Yeah, there's a lot of science happening on the periphery. A lot of science is a part of the plot, but there's mentions of science yeah, in the yeah, show. Yeah. We're at a particle accelerator, but we're not explaining like maybe the book would what a particle accelerator does. Right. We're going to mention that you can't solve the three body problem, but we're not right. even going to tell you what the three body <laughs> problem is. Go to Wikipedia, you know. <laughs> yes. So if you want more of that, the text in the book is heavy on scientific exposition, analogies that might relate sort of what the science is to a general, more general audience. That's one of the things that Lu Shishin, the, the writer of these books, was praised for and won yeah. some of these major awards for. Um, it's deep in sort of that scientific mythology and and sort of factual structure so um yeah they, they this show i hate to use the phrase dumbed it down but removed a lot of that so they could tell more of a a story yeah which which makes sense i mean uh you can see why yeah you wouldn't go on extended tangents about the scientific theories or what have you so i'm not trying to give it too much grief about that i do have some complaints about Mm -hmm. body problem i suppose and maybe a lot of them relate to this you know like the um, the whole ladder plan with the nuclear bombs i don't know i was looking on the internet and i did find some things that said maybe it's not completely implausible like, <laughs> i, I right, think that you know. i enjoyed it more because it failed <laughs> right if if this is succeeded you know and, and we got the knowledge 200 years down the road that we ho hope to get i mean it's like this is one of the most improbable things that's ever been created. So yeah, it, it's it's destined to fail. Yeah, I mean, okay, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, the biggest thing that bothered me for starting on this kind of topic area, um, I was very intrigued at the beginning by the idea that science is broken, mm -hmm. by the um, setup that scientists are um, killing themselves. Yeah, right. Which as we move forward, might not be true. Maybe, maybe they weren't really, maybe they were being murdered. Yes. Um, and I'm already, I mean, but was that always the case? Maybe that's not entirely clear. That that muddies the waters a little bit. Um, but the point I was really trying to hit here is they kind of say science is broken, but is it's not, right? I mean, like, or, okay, they messed up the particle accelerators. Mm-hmm. 
who cares? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, or why do I care? I mean, I'm sorry. No yeah. offense to people at CERN or whatever in the real <laughs> world sitting here in 2024. I'm aware of these particle accelerator accelerators existing and as a relative layman don't really uh, care all that much or feel like they are of great significance yeah. other than to the uh, most abstruse levels of theoretical physics. There's some implication in the show, I guess, that they'll be of some importance down the line in terms of technological development, you know, and, and maybe that's plausible. Yeah. Um, but at first I felt like, oh, this is really intriguing if like, the laws of physics are broken, but they're they're ultimately not, from what I can tell, through eight, eight episodes. It's just like a... they're not broken. It, it, so I think there's maybe three things to um, to point out here. Number one, that they, it is explained when we have this eye in the sky moment at the end of episode five, when the aliens reveal themselves to Earth, that um, at least their messenger Tatiana reveals that. They are afraid that over the 400 years it will take them to get here, that Earth will advance technologically beyond what the aliens have. So their weapon against them is going to be to stop the progress of technology. So in doing that, they're going to do it basically in two ways. To take some of these things that are, I guess what they're trying to say, are the most cutting edge or leading edge of, of technology advancement and have it say, okay, we're stopping that by skewing the results by having you say that what you you don't understand what's happening anymore you don't know what you're doing but also through the intimidation factor right so we can't forget what was happening back in episodes one and two where augie was seeing that countdown in her in her field of vision and there's sort of this threat of if you don't stop what you're doing then something horrible is going to happen to you so sort of this combination of we're gonna make it seem like science doesn't work anymore but also that your life may end if you continue working on this, on, on this problem. So there's, those were, you know, those people were, were selected for a reason. And so that sort of became the mission of what they were trying to do is stop that, stop that progress altogether. Yeah. Which I get that, I think, you know, and okay, fair enough. That's what the story is. Yeah. And, and maybe I'm really an outlier here where part of me is more disappointed <laughs> that it wasn't deeper in a way, you know, some yeah. stuff early on got me thinking about, and I'm going to get, in the, let me get in the weeds for a minute in, in, in philosophical terms. You have this question that people like Rene, Rene Descartes grappled with in the early modern period, you know, 500 years ago, 400 years ago, um, of like, how do you know that the truth is the truth when you're not thinking about it? <laughs> right. There Descartes says, Hey, look, if I'm doing a geometric proof, yeah. I know it's absolutely certain that it's true when I'm thinking about the geometric proof. But then I want to say it's still true when I'm not thinking about the geometric proof. Is it sufficiently mm -hmm. clear? So Descartes has like, how do I know that the interior angles of a triangle are always 180 degrees when I'm not thinking about triangles? And of course, Descartes says, God. <laughs> it's a nice, satisfying answer, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, then, you know, maybe 150 years later, maybe a little bit less, David Hume comes along, he's sort of asking the same question from, a different philosophical point of view and he sort of says well you don't you don't know that that the laws of nature always remain the same we just have to presume this right and maybe you can say oh it's a well-grounded presumption because human nature is a part of nature or something like yeah. that that's all yeah. to do but anyway whole history of like worrying about that kind of problem so there is the at least conceptual possibility of what if what if the laws of physics changed right um, but okay, we're we're not really playing with that, I don't think. Yeah, and I will say to your point, we may have even talked about this analogy before. Or maybe we, you and I talked about this uh, offline somewhere. There are some very interesting analogies in the book that talk about this, right? That as humans, we have this perception of the, the, the most, I think, interesting analogy they use is of a pool table, right? And they talk about, okay, if I move this pool table to the other side of the room, or I move it upstairs, or I move it across the street, or I move it to the other side of the world, no matter how I hit the cue, if I hit the same spot, same degree, same force, same velocity, it's always going to do the same thing, right? Now, that makes sense to us because we understand the rules of what exists on this earth. What they're trying to say is that we have never encountered something that can come in and change those rules for us. 
And that's what this approaching or incoming civilization can do, right? And so it has this sort of exposition that really makes a lot of things make sense in the book that we don't see a lot of in the in the show. But I don't know if they can. I mean, even you go back to the title, three body, the three body problem. <clears throat> so if people aren't aware, and I don't know, you could you could possibly have watched the show on Netflix and still be unaware. Really, mm. well, it is briefly mentioned. But the three body problem in physics, infamously, is that you cannot predict the interaction of of three bodies, right? So if you've got three planets or three suns, like they do in the solar system, we're exposed to. Um, you can do it with two, yeah, right, but um, not with three that are interacting in terms of their gravitational poles and all of that. People look at this really, but you know, I mean, from the point of view of thinking about physics as a human science, one might be tempted to say, "Well, this is a limitation of our science. Right, that we have not been able to figure out." Going back to Isaac Newton, you know. Or further, but like Isaac Newton's posing the problem, but we've mm -hmm. still not been able to to, to to solve the three body problem. Yeah, right to the point where our um, our friend Jin here in the show says it's unsolvable. Well, yeah. the aliens agree, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it would almost be more striking if like this advanced alien species could solve it. You know, like they yeah. had more advanced physics, but apparently, uh, apparently they don't. So. That's implying that this unsolvable problem is is somehow like kind of intrinsically unsolvable or or something like that, which which it remains in line with what we know about physics, yeah. broadly speaking. Yeah. And I I mean I frankly love that we're having this discussion because what we're doing now is is what's reflected in you know 580 pages in the in the book that they just can't get into in in the show. You know we've yeah. I've written in, in the pieces I wrote for this about this show is that you know these five main characters this oxford five that exists in our present day are not in the book at all these okay. characters which many often weiss and Wu had to create sort of represent different you know reflections or emotions or different ways of approaching the problem that one character in the book uh is, is focused on so you sort of have to have this tension you see how these characters do different things um and so they had to make it such that this is a problem. We talked about this in, before and wrote about this in the pieces. There have been other attempts, at least in this country, of adapting this. And they said, oh, we just can't do it. It's too complicated. Yeah. And so being out from Weissman, we had to sort of figure out the ways to make that happen um, that was more digestible, I guess, by this, you know, at least by our Western audience. That's fair enough. Let's go. Let's get more, I don't know. Yeah. Plot. What? <laughs> ethical. Or yeah. well, let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Yeah. Um, Sort of striking scene with Little Red Riding Hood. Yeah. Um, with uh, Santi, apparently. I know, no, we don't trust you because you lie. Um, now we're afraid of you. Um, I had a couple of different directions to go with that. You want to start in terms of... Yeah, it, it goes you? back to sort of what you were thinking about, the idea of, of truth. So in this scene that we're talking about, Jonathan Price, who plays Mike Evans, is communicating with the Santi and he tells them the story of Little Red Riding Hood. He's been telling them stories or or having conversations with them, try to give them a sense of what their what our civilization is, but they cannot understand the concept of the wolf deceiving someone. They can understand this concept of fiction. They can understand the concept of what they perceive to be as lying or mistruth. Because I guess their civilization just does not have that as a part of who they they are. And because they see these stories as a reflection of who we are. You know, Mike Evans, who thought, oh, well, our little boat, our, you know, our ship of people that are the followers of you will be safe, now seems to be sort of persona, persona non grata for this civilization says, we can't do anything with you. I think the implication being, we're going to come and wipe everyone out, even those of you that have said that you follow us or want to, you know, be a part of who we are. Right, which so previously the... It seems first that the other kind of plan about forestalling human technological development that's ultimately revealed, and this would include with the uh, SOFONs and all of that, that, that other kind of plan was already in place, though, prior to this, right? 
and and so then it's only like that the um, maybe they were thinking that this particular group <clears throat> led by Mike Evans and uh, Yeo and G, that that, that 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 group, the kind of cult of the Santee, which is overblown in my mind in terms of the religious yeah. <laughs> angle. Um, like it'd be easier for me to sympathize with them if they weren't getting all religious about it. Yes. Um, but that they, that they would be safe, but that they would be the only ones who would be safe. But then in this scene, no longer them either. Or I don't, I don't know. I sort of yeah, think about right, right, all that together. I, I get the impression that this cult or this group developed as you know we want to be the um the ones that roll out the red carpet for the Santi when they arrive right yeah. so the ones that buy into what they're doing we we recognize them as i think they call them lord we recognize them as sort of the, the people that we want to devote ourselves to and so we feel in doing that that we will be safe when they come I, that's the implication i get or that's the what i think the impression is that i get um from that group whereas once the true nature of us in in our entirety is learned they said we'll forget you know there's no one that's that's safe from from this yeah i think something like that something like that just thinking about the because the way it plays out it almost doesn't feel like that in the show yeah. right because we find out about um the plan with the uh, sofons and everything afterwards mm -hmm. but i think it's clear that they were already doing that before this scene. Um, another question I have here, though, trying to pull a couple things together. You mentioned the kind of digital countdown mm. appearing, and first of all, if that would happen to me, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how she like goes about her life for a couple days. You know, like <laughs> I wouldn't just be worried about hitting zero. I'm like, this has to go away. I can't do anything <laughs> till this goes away. You know. <laughs> Uh, and anyhow, um, how do we read this? Because of course, there is the fear that when the countdown hits zero, something is going to happen. But from what we know about the technology they deployed, as primarily you know surveillance and creating an illusion or, or what have you, yeah, I don't know. Was something really going to happen? And then let me get this all out there, and we'll talk about it all at once. Um. Isn't this kind of lying? <laughs> Isn't it? You know. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. Um, I'm trying to recall from the text if there was an instance where the countdown never got to zero, and if when the countdown got to zero, I think what we're meant to believe is that Tatiana or some version of Tatiana who can't be seen on camera, can't be witnessed, can only be seen by those that they want. To be you know, want to see her shows up and and takes the life of whoever stopped the countdown i think that before the aliens revealed themselves there was the sense of we don't want to do that and it, it it in a way that to not do that we just have to have the people that are working on this progressive science to stop doing it right to say okay we're going to have the humans stop themselves instead of us stop them right the murder is much more mysterious than someone saying this nanotechnology doesn't work, we're going to stop doing it. Yeah. I just don't know if it's fully coherent. So yeah. why did they kill um, Samwell? What's his name in this chat? <laughs> yes. Um, his name in the show, he's Jack. Wrong, I think but Jack Rooney. Yeah, yeah John yeah. Bradley plays, plays Jack Rooney. So why did they kill him? He, he's because, he has, chips. because he has the real information now. He knows what's happening. But has said, I don't buy into it i guess and so you know his his he's he's out of there he's he's been a problem he's been a part of let's see he um and now i'm, okay, I'm trying to remember the name of the um of the character uh he and jen have gotten to a point where they have solved much of the three-body problem within the game mm -hmm. he has information not many people have most people i guess become converts at that point he says no thanks so because he has that information, he then has to die, according to this group. That's my that's my opinion on that. I guess. And then maybe I can blame the human being cult group as opposed to blaming the Santi aliens. Themselves. I'm trying to be charitable to the Santi. Like, I want to be on your side, guys. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're, 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 you're saying we can't trust you because you're liars. It's like, OK, I'm a Kantian. I'm with you, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm half joking. Um, <laughs> and I do think that's an interesting element of the story to think about, but they don't play with it as much as they could. And I want to talk to you about this question also. So I put in their notes, one of the things that was striking me throughout is they, they, they pretty much never talk about global warming or anything <laughs> along those lines. It, it's mentioned weirdly it's mentioned yeah. in a news story that you kind of hear in the background, though. So it's not as though it's a fictional world where it doesn't exist, apparently. Right. But you have people saying, oh, well, these aliens aren't going to arrive for 400 years. You have them playing with the possibility of kind of taking the position of, who cares? I'll be dead by then. I'm just going to live my life and enjoy my life, you know? Right. right. Um, you have other people saying, oh, don't we have, we have more pressing problems in less than 400 years, you know? And I just kept thinking, like maybe, like climate change, maybe. You yeah. Know, so, what like, are you, yeah, if your if your thought on this is, what do we care about four hundred years from now? Because because climate change is going to kill us in two hundred years. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, I, like, 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 is it that maybe like these these people seem pretty confident that humanity's going to be around in four hundred years and. I mean, you know, how, how but without anything being done to stop us, we're going to surpass the Santi technologically and all of that. It just, it just felt weird to me as a. How disappointing for the Santi when they arrive and you know Earth is gone because we we just, we destroyed it, man. Just a waste of a trip. Yeah, so I mean, I guess one question I have for you, I having read the book, is there any more mention? Is there any more stuff about you know those types of environmental concerns in the book as opposed in to the, the TV show, or is it just in also? Book and a half, so I've read a book and a half of the second. I do not recall anything about about global warming. Um, Interesting on that, but it, the, the whole story is sort of this. Um, it, it, it's an allegory that is the dangers of doing certain things and the dangers of not doing certain things. Right? Well, right, and that's the other reason I'm thinking about this is because there's a certain temptation to almost take the alien invasion story as an allegory for something like global warming. Yeah. It's a threat, but it's not going to be a threat until, you know, generations not yet born are around, right? Long after we're yeah. dead, you know, this sort of thing. Should we be motivated to do things now to prevent catastrophe hundreds of years from now? You know, it, it plays on that level, but then it's like weirdly, yeah, it's direct, abs absolutely, the direct yeah. thing's weirdly missing to me. I don't know. I, I will be, so I, I will report back. I do know the third book progressing the timeline towards much closer to the time that 400 years is, you know, it's, it's upon us. And so I'm curious what, if anything, it touches on there. So I've already read that one. I'll have to give, give you more of an update on that. All right. I mean, I don't know if, if it's not in the beginning, there's almost nothing for it because look, I'm not, how to say this. I'm not saying that I feel like the show needs to be giving it a real central place necessarily, yeah. but it i found myself wondering throughout this first season whether it was a real thing in this world is it something that these characters know about right yeah. because like if it's this world and a real thing within it right like and you're talking about physicists and stuff and just that they it doesn't get mentioned right yeah. listen they got other environmental scientists working on that problem while <laughs> others are working on the nuclear propulsion parachute right you got yeah, you, just, different areas of expertise right i just feel like you should at least have some doomer character who's like <laughs> who cares 400 years from now is the funny uh humanity's already going to be extinct because of global warming yeah or something yeah. i don't know it just, just seems like that would have made a little bit more yeah a little, little more 2024 in that uh in that moment it does sort of circle back to um and you think about in the context of what we're experiencing today what is hopeless versus what's inevitable versus what we need to focus on and what we don't that it does all go back to this one character in 1960s early 70s china who her personal experiences are such that we are lost humanity cannot save itself you know has all these horrific things happen to her so she chooses yes i will respond to the aliens or to give them the roadmap as it were to get here right and that's not that, that was in more of a political cultural environment less of a 
you know, more sci scientific or technical discussions that we might be having today. But there certainly are some political conversations that we can have today to look at how, you know, our our country, and our world might be lost. But it just sort of was interesting to think about that decision of that one person who decided humanity is lost mm -hmm. could lead to humanity being lost and just sort of the, the parallels that you can draw there of, yeah, that was back in a one specific instance of one specific country in one specific moment in time, but it does reflect sort of more of a, a culture that we're in, we're in today. Yeah. And that's fair enough. I mean, all sorts of things, you yeah. know, get lumped in there. And I did think that that was an interesting context um, for her in the cultural revolution, Maoist China, all of that. And you think about the world at the time, Cold War, nuclear, nuclear proliferation. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, cut to now also. It's, I don't know, look at the world in political terms, geopolitical terms. It can be hard to feel exactly hopeful. Um, but then ultimately she kind of does repent on that front. Um, what what is what do you think about that movement, right? Because a part of me almost felt like, okay, I get what led her to make this move in the first place, this kind of despair over humanity. I get that. Um, I almost didn't buy her repenting about it later as much. And I almost felt like it would have been more compelling if she'd stuck to her guns about it all the way up to her death or something. Yeah, I think I think I have this right. That is a tremendous deviation from the from the books that she's sort of okay. committed. I, I think I have that right. Um, but yeah, that just didn't, didn't land well with me. Or let me sort of end of life as it's use your word, repent of this, go and make my uh, amends with whatever I need to, or whoever I need to, and then just go back to the place where this began and let Tatiana just sort of peacefully take my, take my life after I've done that, you know, just didn't, wasn't, wasn't, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it plays like she's um, finding out about the Little Red Riding Hood situation uh, and that they don't trust them anymore and that, like, her group's not going to be safe. And then that's a turning point for her. But it's hard for me to respect it. It's like, oh, now you're going to be selfish? Now, yeah. now you're going to be, like, tribalistic? Or yeah, your, your daughter killed herself. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. hey, that didn't do it, right? Yeah, I think it would have... It would have been more compelling to me if she had remained, however irrationally, in the space of um, I trust in the Santi to do what's yeah. best, even yeah. even despite this, even though they've apparently, um, you know, whatever, betrayed my group or, or, or at this point, I still just trust. Like we were going to do any better anyway. I still just yeah. trust them to do whatever is best. Yeah, too. you spent yeah. sixty years thinking that humanity is lost. You know, and you're going to trust in this in this other thing to redeem us or save us or whatever. Why at the at the eleventh minute, eleventh hour, did you did you change? And there's it? yeah, and there's also this weird implication in that scene that she knew that if they found out that we lie, that that would be a problem, and I, that doesn't quite land for me either. Like what you were you were yeah. somehow hiding. Yeah, yeah, you know, or thinking you were hiding um, the fact that humanity engages in deception. So I don't know that that whole scene didn't, didn't land very well for me. But yeah, yeah, I guess she's uh, that, that's one I wish I wish was not in there. Frankly, we could have done without it. We could have done without that. Yeah. Another thing, this is related to something you put in notes about the Judgment Day scene. This is, I mean, there's something very powerful about that scene. But also, I, I found myself wondering, this is back to the science gripe a little bit, like, why did they have to do the nanotechnology thing? Because, like, if you look at what happens, it's kind of like, it seems pretty similar to blowing up with a bomb to me. Yeah. It's funny how much, it, there are a lot of things different from the book. This is, I mean, almost identical. In the book, it starts going through even more justifications of, why can't we do it this way? Why can't we send in a team? Why can't we bomb the place? Why can't we you know, gas it, knock everybody out. Why can't we, they have the, he just has all these justifications for why they can't do that. It almost in the book reads like, I know that this cool technology exists and I want to come up with a reason to use it. Um, and so I'm sure, you know, being up and wise, we were like, great, you know, let's find a way to film this, this cool thing. There have been hundreds of pieces that have come out of this basically saying this could not, this, this cannot happen. <laughs> what we have exists today. 
it would be yeah but it still would have landed for me better even if it was even more implausible if it hadn't been explosions and fire and all of that yeah uh as a part of the scene if exactly. they somehow just had the thing cleanly cut it into pieces with no fire or explosion and kill all the people <laughs> and then just be laid out neatly so they could come there's all this fire and explosion and all of that kind of stuff and for all you know you're looking for a notebook yeah exactly you know exactly. and in the way they presented it, it just was like all right i guess i guess we just have to accept that but it just I, at the end of the day it didn't really seem motivated that they had I was absolutely a, I, was, yeah, I always had a problem accepting the fact that you can't i guess it's a small chance and you're looking for a very small thing that they're trying to to procure there but you can't guarantee that wire's not going to cut through that thing as you enact that plan either i mean i guess that's true too yeah so. I, guess that's true, but, you know, they could have i don't know again maybe getting a step even more implausible said well with this nanotechnology we're just going to like turn the whole ship into into little neat little cubes exactly. or something like that you know or or slices because they haven't sliced but then the fact that it explodes and there's fire <laughs> and then they just magically walk right up and go here's the hard drive there it is like, yep. we uh, found it. yeah okay. it, was, it was interesting i was reading something that um the three uh showrunners said about this and other scenes and one of them said yeah this is this was my favorite scene obviously it was so much fun to shoot so much fun to create to envision all of this another one said yeah that was great but really my favorite scene was jonathan price talking to a microphone telling the little red riding hood story and just sort of like this sense of the magnitude of scale between different things in this show um because a lot yeah. of people that i've read and talked to that episode five with this scene yeah that was sort of the highlight of the series and others have said oh no it was this oh, sort of the the real intricate nature of the communication and then the relationships that were developed amongst the people in the present day so it's just you know just sort of how you how you interpreted the, the different things there yeah that's fair and i will say i know i've levied some complaints against the show but there is a way in which it captured my imagination. And I almost realized this more since I finished watching it a couple of nights ago, that it's still kind of in my brain. It's still yeah. percolating around in, in my imagination. So um, it's got that going for it, I'll yeah. say. You know, it's got this kind of intriguing world that it managed to invest me in. Yeah. So I think a lot of science fiction focuses on the what we did to get here. Now this one has to focus on, it's going to have to focus a lot on what are we going to do to get to a certain point or to stop a certain thing or to prevent a th thing. And whether you're using that as specifically or or exclusively to talk about aliens coming or using that to talk about what can we as civilization do if we have to face a big problem like climate change. There's just um, the forward nature looking of this um, show, which again, this is just the first of three seasons. I think it's going to be interesting as we get into, I can only presume that the next two seasons will follow a path of we get closer and closer and closer to 400 years from now. And how are we handling this? Yeah, I, I do wonder about that. And um, book readers, I'm sure know a bit more. Um, let's talk about Will and Saul a little bit. Um, I guess they, they make Will a brain in the vat. They're trying to send him on this probe, which fails to get the propulsion but I guess still exists out there going slower. Is yeah. That the right he, read? Well, he's out there, but he's off course. He's not on a trajectory to intercept this Santi oh, ship. He's also off. He's also on yeah. the wrong trajectory. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So that is a, that their plan of them finding his crypto frozen brain and reviving him and recreating him so that he can somehow signal back to Earth. That's yeah. That plan is. Is, is gone i mean that was a, even more implausible than the than the <laughs> thousand nuclear bombs anyways but neither here nor there yeah so okay outside chance of something happening with that but probably that's just a failure and probably not probably, and probably, probably not. Yeah. over yeah uh and then towards the i think it's in the last episode of the season saul is to his surprise yeah, named as a wall facer and you have this whole mm -hmm idea of the wall facer program as a way to fight against the aliens who have surveillance everywhere thoughts about all of that yeah i so the wall facer program is introduced in the beginning of the second book so basically i've stopped right and in, in reading it right after they have introduced this idea 
Okay. So I don't know where what happens with that idea. And if you just watch this, it, it's almost seems as implausible as some of these other things. There's going to be three people in the world that are going to mentally prepare for something to happen and pass these ideas along, I guess. Um, you know, like I said, I don't understand the timeline of this because obviously these three people are not going to exist 400 years from now. So I guess they're going to pass on their plans to other people. Um but they have to, I just don't understand okay, the, the, the realism of we're going to have plans that are not any sort of database or computer written down or anything that we can at a moment's notice enact whatever it is. And the Santi won't have time to react to that. that that's basically what the wall, wall facers are. I thought it seemed a little bit more complex than that from what I gathered. I also, I did go and like re read something. So maybe... It's very kind of quick and thrown in in the show. And I think mm -hmm. you mentioning that it's introduced at the beginning of the second book makes sense to me because I think it's introduced in the last episode of the first season to set up yes. the second season. Correct. Right. Like I do think this is going to be an important element of where the story is going. Yeah. But as I understood, the idea was that these wall facers, um, yeah, so they're supposed to think about plans just in themselves and not put them out in the world. But the other aspect of this, which I do think they say in the last episode of season one here, um, is that everyone's supposed to follow their orders without questioning. Exactly. <laughs> so they're not supposed to tell anyone what the plan is yeah. at all, but then they can give orders that everyone's supposed to follow, at least in the government or, or whatever, uh, whoever's involved in this, without, without question, and maybe they're, they're potentially encouraged to even do some stuff kind of on a lark to confuse the Santi or whatever. And I kind of get the idea, if you have this alien threat who's got global surveillance of everything that we're doing, mm -hmm. the thought is, well, they're, they're not mind readers, right? right? So maybe there's some space for some select group of people to work on plans that they're kept, kept private they were going to empower these people in this way. And I mean, the, 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 the negative of that is obvious. So it'd be kind of interesting to see where it goes. I agree with what you said though, in terms of like the plausibility of this working as yeah. a way to, it, it is, is hmm. yeah, it's pretty and, well. Uh, I don't, I don't and, know that it's going to work. Yeah. And I don't know, like if say by, the middle of the second book and the middle of the second season that this has gone the way of the, the nuclear bombs where they've abandoned it or, you know, they've decided that it's, it's, it's not possible. You know, I, I just don't, I don't know. And I think, yeah, or you get a counter, I know. Yeah. You get, you get an opposition to it because you have these people out there in the world, just like giving orders and making decisions without any rationale. Exactly. And that, that's part of the whole idea. You know, I can definitely see that happening. You did make me wonder, noting the, the time scale of it, whether it would mm -hmm. be like a Dalai Lama kind of thing <laughs> yeah. uh, in terms of who becomes the next uh, wall facer. Do you know what I'm talking about? What's the other one? There's the Dalai Lama and then there's the other Lama. Ugh. Anyhow, in religious terms, right, of course, this is a, the reincarnated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, almost need that term but anyway my understanding of how they have it set up is the one identifies the other so there's two actually right yeah and there there is someone in the world tasked with saying this is the th this is the reincarnation of the dalai lama do you know what i'm talking about yes yes i do know what you're talking about yeah you know politically it's actually really complex because <laughs> china has that person right. who is supposed to identify the next dalai lama um and so potentially the currently living Dalai Lama has said that he might be the last Dalai Lama because there's a question of whether you can trust the identification of the next Dalai Lama or whatever. Yeah. Anyhow, got in the weeds <laughs> about this and forgotten one of the terms. But anyway, you could you'd it would have to be almost something like this, right? Where yeah. where the wall facer appoints their successor or something it's going to last yeah. 400 years I, I just think as you start playing telephone across 400 years that if you if you've got the best possible plan it's going to 
it's going to leak out. And also was a bit confusing at the same time, you know, suspend some disbelief for this, but Liam Cunningham, who plays Thomas Wade, has devised a plan where he's going to put himself in cryo sleep and wake up every 10 years. Right. But they've not made any mention that that's what they're going to do to the wall facer folks to make sure that they're, you know, it's some, there's some continuity in what they're planning and what they want to do. But Wade wants to do this to make sure, you know, he oversees the plans and how they're supposed to happen over the next several hundred years. Yeah. So maybe the, maybe it actually wouldn't be a Dalai Lama type of thing. That, that wouldn't work because they couldn't have a way to, to pass their planning to the next one. Right. Yeah. So maybe it's you, you get a lifetime as a wall facer. And then once you're dead, they'll just appoint another wall facer. It'd have to almost be something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we'll see where that goes. I'm sure that's going to be a big part of season two. Yeah, I, I'm I'm sure. And that was one of the things, again, I, I put this in our notes that baffled me a little bit is that Saul almost seems like he is literally there for nothing. The first seven episodes of the season, he just does literally nothing. And yeah. then so we have just like he is confused. We are as confused as he is. Why is he chosen for this? We don't really have a concept of that yet. They said it was not time to reveal it to him. Um, Dr. Wenji sits down with him and sort of tells him this story, this joke, um, to help him try to understand why he has been chosen. Um, but we really don't know that reason. And I think, as you said, that'll be a big part of, of what's unveiled next season. Yeah, for sure. So I did enjoy watching this, Ryan. It, yeah. I mean, and, you know, it had been on my list, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I had the intention even of watching it right when it came out and I didn't. So we have the time here. Um, Anything else you want to hit on before we wrap up here? No, that's what I had on uh, on my list. Yeah, we don't have any sense of when the next two seasons will come out, but we do have a confirmation they will get two more and that they will align in you know, some way with those those next two novels. So, um, you know, just I guess maybe a last question. Do you, do you think this would have been a show that would have benefited from the week to week as opposed to the binge? Probably. I mean, insofar as I tend to think that about everything. Um, yeah. yeah. The, I, I binged it, so I, it's hard for me to yeah. <laughs> get too down on the binge watching experience. I definitely think it worked as a binge watch. And, um, and, you know, one of the big things that I always have in mind in criticizing the all at once model is that it has a, things have a way of being in the cultural conversation for a short period of time and then and then kind of fading, whereas if you're doing it yeah. week to week, you can really kind of stretch that out, all the stuff around the show. Yeah. So that that's where, with this one, I think it would have benefited in ways that are hard to predict, having people just talking about it, mm -hmm. doing podcasts in between episodes uh, and, and all of that. And one, yeah. you know, there's no way of knowing exactly what that would look like, but... I can certainly see a show like this inspiring that kind of activity in Absolutely. a way where instead you get, I mean, like probably most things that are out there are kind of like what we just did talking about the whole season at once. Yeah, that, that, that that's exactly what it is. I've consumed a lot of those things and you just, it's a story that now that it's all there, you just, it's hard to break up. Like it was hard to break up and write about it because so many pieces led and connected to others. Um, but yeah, everything out there is either preseason or postseason, you know, and for lack of a better term. Yeah, I'm sure mm -hmm. someone out there has done episode recaps somewhere. I'm sure <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, like we true. see you if you're listening. You let us know about <laughs> it if you want. Uh, if you went episode by episode. But it's very hard to do when you know that the world is pushing forward. Exactly. Um, so well, that's speaking, of a show, speaking of a show that should be week to week, but has dropped as a bench. We yeah, should talk a little bit about, we're going to move on to next week, The Bear. Right, so we're gearing up for season three of The Bear, which yep. will release all at once on June 27th. Um, definitely we're going to talk about that once it's out. And we have to think a little bit more about exactly how we're going to approach that. We get to talk about that a little bit. We can do that off the air. Um, but then next week, in preparation for that, we're going to talk about The Bear what do you have in mind exactly? We look back at season two. We speculate about season three. We what 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 all do you want to do next week? Right? Yeah, I think it'd just be interesting just to you know level set where we are, where we left everyone, um, what we might expect coming for three. I think there are some pretty um, interesting threads that were left dangling, particularly with 
um, with Carm, with um, Marcus, with um, I think just how all we saw in the restaurant was a sneak preview, you know, a friends and family night. Um, certainly what's going to be a big part of the season is just the the dynamic and the challenge of keeping a, a successful restaurant going. So, but in, in addition to that, just some of the things I think we need to catch up on of where we left these characters, because that lead a lot into sort of the, the dynamics of what they do in the next season. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to season three. Um, and yeah, again, well, we, we do need to talk about how we're going to approach season three on the podcast, but mm-hmm. we'll do that. We don't need to do that on the podcast. So, right. okay, we won't get there. Right now. Um, <laughs> so, okay, I think that does it for this week. Thanks as always for listening. Uh, if you've enjoyed the pod, please do. It's a really good rating, review, wherever you're listening. If you're on YouTube, give a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. Um, check out tvobsessive.com. You can follow the site on social media, on X, Facebook, Blue Sky, Threads, Instagram, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, we'll see you next week. All right, looking forward to it. Talk to you then.